One of the longest serving finance ministers in this country, South Africa, in our nation, is Mr. Trevor Manuel, who's recently been appointed chairman of uh, Old Mutual. And he is joining us to talk about the current state of affairs, his new position, his experience. And of course, at this time, the nation that seems to be in turmoil around the Constitutional Court ruling in terms of the responsibilities of the president and uh, his liabilities in terms of his Nkantla home, as well as the constitution that he is said to have violated. The constitution, uh, Constitutional Court said that the president did not abide by his oath. Those would be some of the issues we talk about. We'll talk about his experience in politics. We'll talk about his experience now in business and uh, also his personal development over the years, going back to the days of the UDF. Mr. Trevor Manuel, pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Too. Much appreciated. I wish we could just go back to that time of activism when you were still uh, a youngster in the Western Cape, mobilizing communities and so forth. But we'll get to that point at, uh, at a later stage. Let's deal with the current situation that we find the nation in at this time. President taken to the Constitutional Court, Constitutional Court finds against him as well as against the National Assembly. How did you feel when you listened to the Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng hand down his ruling? You know, I, I am very attached to the Constitution because of its origin. When I look at the Constitution, uh, I look at the preamble, I look at the founding provisions, I look at the Bill of Rights, and then I know that it was the President of the African National Congress, Oliver Tambo, that put all of this in place. And it's for that reason that the Constitution echoes the traditions of the African National Congress and the Freedom Charter as strongly as it does. So the Constitution, the first words are a call on us to remember the sacrifices of those for justice. Now, this is a particularly poignant moment in the history of this country. This week marks the 27th anniversary of the judicial murder of Solomon Mashlangu. He was a big motivator in our lives. We sing his praises. Uh, uh, how do we honor him when the courts actually have to remind us that we have a responsibility to who we are and where we come from? I think it's a very deep tragedy. The, the reality, of course, and it's set out very well in the judgment, uh, and, and, and bear in mind, that it's a consensus judgment of the 11 judges of, this, of the Constitutional Court. The, the consensus view is that you know, they could go as far as they can, but in the separation of powers, they couldn't explain how the president actually should exercise his executive authority. Similarly, the court couldn't tell parliament how to do its work, but it could point out and did point out that Parliament had failed the Constitution by not exercising oversight over the way in which the executive functions. My own sense of it it's, is that it's a deep moment of crisis in our country, but we must be thankful that we have a system of courts that is as resolute as it is. But if we want our democracy to function, then it's largely how the other two arms of government work. Does the executive actually live out its responsibility to serve the people every single day? And does the parliamentary system oversee that the executive does it? And if that is working, then the court should be at sleep. Mm. Uh, you shouldn't have the court in your face every single day. Our problem right now is that because the other two arms of government appear to be uh, uh, less active about what they should be doing, it actually calls for the courts to act, but judicial activism is always uh, a bad thing because the judges are not elected by anybody. So we must express a concern in constitutional terms, but not just for the Constitution. I think our concern must be raised about the ability to serve our people much better. Now, subsequent to that, in fact, even before the court, there was great expectation that the ANC NEC is going to somehow censure the president in terms of the Nkandla matter and other related developments in recent times. That did not materialize. The court sat down, handed down its ruling, and then the call, you know, it's now a crescendo 
was made that the president should step down. What do you think uh, about that call? It's coming from all over the place, the opposition parties, the media, commentators, ordinary folk, including senior members of the ANC, highly respected people like uh, Mr. Ahmed Kathrada, for instance, uh, the veterans of Mkonto Wesizu and others. I think that the, there's a very strong message in the way in which uh, uh, Ahmed Kathrada uh, communicated. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humble message that says, Mr. President, please listen to the people and resign. Because that voice is a very strong voice of the people. It's a voice of thinking people across South Africa, black and white. Uh, it's a voice of people who recognize the strength of our constitution and the value of the decision of the constitutional court. Uh, similarly, um, the, the uh, veterans uh, uh, of Mkonto Wissizwe, the generals actually, um, when they've spoken, I mean, you know, they recognize uh, Jacob Zuma, Mshulosi, as coming from their ranks. Uh, and they take a political view that is premised on the history of who we are and where we come from. And I don't think that, that uh, you can just ignore these kinds of things. I, I once uh, spoke about uh, a situation and I... I said, you know, when my, my sons were growing up, uh, part of what you had to do as a father when you were at home was to read nursery rhymes. And one of the things that the boys loved was uh, the, the story of the gingerbread my, man, because it's run, run as fast as you ca can, you can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man. Now that's a nice story, but it's not so good if you're the president. It's not about your ability to, to evade uh, other people deciding what you should do. It's your ability to lead, which is very different, which is not the gingerbread man. It's the leader of a people, of a nation. Uh, it's living out an oath that you took when you uh, assumed the presidency for the second time on the 24th of May uh, 2014, and an oath which sadly a court had to remind you that you had taken. I think it's a deep tragedy. You have lived through something similar to this, where the former president, Thabo Mbeki, was actually asked to resign by his own organization, the ANC, which he duly did within a day or so. And uh, you also took the step of resigning yourself at that time. And then subsequent to that, a new government being formed, then you got back to the opposition as finance minister. When you look at what is going on now around the, the call that the president should resign, now coming from broader masses of people and different interest groups. At the time, in the case of Tabum Beck, it was coming from specifically the ANC. What, what do you think? I mean, you know, what, how do you compare the two situations? I don't think that the two situations are comparable. Um, what happened ahead of uh, uh, the conference in Pulukwani in uh, 2007, was as that there was a big alliance of people who uh, disagreed and dis uh, disagreed with and disliked Thabo Mbeki as president. I think that he made an error of judgment by wanting to serve a third term as president of the ANC. And it set the stage for a difficulty. A lot of the individuals who were then there and brought uh, Jacob Zuma to power uh, have all abandoned that cause, whether you're talking of uh, the loudest voice there was Julius Malema, or whether you're speaking of uh, Swelling Zima Vavi, or large swathes of the South African Communist Party, or uh, disaffected people who were in the mainstream of the ANC. Uh, it was a large voice um, that then saw Thabo Mbeki uh, not returned as president of the ANC, which then set the scene for an ordinary NEC meeting in September of uh, 2008 to ask him to step aside. Um, now I think the situation is not comparable because it's not, I mean, those forces have all abandoned. I mean, they, they may be reconvening and saying, but you know, what we hoped would happen after uh, the Pulukwani conference has not happened, uh, things have actually taken a turn for the worse. But there is actually a much more, uh, a much broader and more resonant uh, uh, a voice to which you have added the highest court in the land. 
that uh, actually suggests that it's not a minor political infringement, but a violation of the key oath of office of the head of state, which I think uh, uh, is a deep crisis. Uh, I think it's in all of our interests that um, uh, the president actually steps aside. Let's go back to December, when the your, one of your successors, uh, Mr. Ntantlanene, was fired summarily because uh, the nation did not anticipate that, and it seemed like we, you know, South Africa is dealing with its own challenges, ministers in place, and then uh, in the late in the evening on the 9th of uh, December, when he got uh, fired in the manner that he was, he, he was. What did you think of, of those developments? How did you feel when you looked at the way that, you know, he was dismissed in Tantan and having been your, uh, your colleague as well at the finance ministry? Tim, let me just state for the record that I don't ever want to be accused of ruling from the grave. Mm. So I studiously avoided uh, commenting being drawn into any meetings. I wasn't in any meeting. Now I read and hear that um, Johan Rupert flew in uh, and that he demanded a meeting with Cyril Ramaphosa where Maria Ramos and I attended. Uh, that is so patently untrue. I wasn't in any meeting at all, not a single meeting. I, in fact, opted to bite my lip and hold my views to myself until um, the 17th of, of, of December, when um, Minister of, of, of uh, B uh, Small Business, uh, Lindy uh, Zulu, had accused everybody who was in disagreement with the decision of wanting to stage a coup, that I wrote, wrote an open letter that the City Press published. And in it I said, I don't understand. Le leave leave uh, uh, Desmond David van Royen out of the equation for the moment. I cannot understand why you would take a decent, hard-working, committed, smart, efficient and capable minister like Ntlantla Nene and drop him without reason and then conjure up some reason like uh, that he, he will be required to sit in the regional office of uh, uh, a bank to be developed which may utilize 10 to 15 percent of his responsible time that he had demonstrated in the finance ministry. Why do you do those kinds of things? I was, I was pretty shocked by the way in which it happened and that it happened at all, uh, which is why, you know, having held uh, my own views, uh, bitten my lip, when the opportunity arose to say this isn't a coup, it's about, it's about us as Democrats expressing concern uh, when, when you remove somebody from office without just cause. Now, let me go back to that uh, point you mentioned where it is said yourself and your wife, Maria Ramos, uh, and now uh, the Deputy President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa met with Johan Rupert. How, how does it make you feel? I mean, when you read those reports, and of course, you know, they get repeated over and over. This was said somewhere, and there might be people who believe that. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was said somewhere. I think even worse... Uh I'm told that it was raised in an NEC. Um, I, can't, I can't quite fathom why people would, would make up lies. Um, but if anybody had asked my opinion or, or, or for confirmation, I'd be able to say without fear of contradiction that I wasn't in any meeting. I know that my wife participated in a meeting and present in that meeting with the Treasurer General of the ANC and uh, the minister in the presidency, Jeff Khadebe, with a number of other people from banks and so on. I wasn't present. Mm. I didn't influence what happened in that meeting. Um, so, you know, but people need to conjure. There, there, there's a fundamental problem mm. uh, which, which I think uh, arose uh, in, the way, in, in the place where, where the debate uh, first, first uh, uh, poked out its head. And that is that there's an accusation of state capture. And um, in respect of, of, of that issue, there's a, there's a narrative that people then try and, and suggest. It's not just that 
that the Guptas have the present admins. Well, everybody has been captured by the state. Therefore, you know, if, if the Guptas have us, then Rupert has somebody else. It's not like that. Nobody, nobody, no other wealthy business person, doesn't matter whether you're talking of Patrice Mutsepe, Johan Rupert, uh, uh, Nikki Oppenheimer, have said, have invited somebody to their home and said, Tim Odise, I want to appoint you minister of something tomorrow. Uh, are you happy with it? Nobody else has ever behaved like that. I think we've got a deep crisis on that front as well. Mr. Trevor Manuel is our guest, and we are talking to him here on tonight with Tim Modise. And uh, we are just expanding on a couple of issues, as you've heard for yourself, some of the views he has on the current events.